uh, welcome that. Uh, our announcements are before you in, in the bulletin and the words to our, to our hymns. A um, couple of corrections. The, the, the group this meeting is, is not on, on Tuesday. Is, is not the, the uh, circle meeting, the Martha circle, but it's the PWCT, this meeting at that time and, and place. And then what's listed there is Saturday the 21st. That's actually what happened yesterday. So um, you have to get in a time machine uh, to, 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 to experience those things. And, and uh, they were wonderful. We had our first men's gathering uh, of, of the fall, first time since COVID hit. We had wonderful fellowship together. Thanks for getting us together. And then we did some parking lot fundraising for the plant in the garden show, which is going on at, at, as we speak. Um, I want you to note that the, this, this coming Thursday, over here on, on the lawn and in front of City Hall, there will be a community prayer gathering. Praying for our community, praying for our nation, and praying for our uh, state. An ecumenical, inter, interracial thing. Everyone's invited. I'm going to be helping uh, participate and, and lead some of that. So everyone's invited. Uh, then next Sunday is our commitment Sunday here in the church. Uh, hope you've received your, your stewardship letter and your pledge commitment card. And, and you'll have a chance, as we do, to, to bring that forward as an act of worship and, and dedication to God at the close of our worship. If you can't be with us, you're welcome to, to, uh, to mail that in. We hope that you will all be participating in that as well. Next Sunday, we uh, are scheduled to receive some new members. And so looking forward to that. And, and uh, if you've been thinking about that and would like to, to join this church family uh, at that time, contact me this, this coming week. Also, uh, next Sunday, uh, believe it or not, after worship is over, after we have dedicated our pledge cards and giving God thanks for Thanksgiving. Then we're going to start decorating for Christmas. <laughs> and so we're asking uh, those of you that, that can and are able to, to remain after and help, help do that for just a little while. A prayer concern updates. We had several this, this week. Um, Barry Long, uh, Barry is in the back. He has successful surgery on his ulnar nerve. Um, now that's, that's, same kind of surgery that baseball players have. So I think I would say that's what you had. It, it was actually to correct something that was uh, done during his other surgery earlier. But it's the same thing that professional baseball pitchers have, and that's gone well. We're thankful for that. Um, Don Caporell, who's out of Texas now, had a seizure uh, caused by a very serious brain tumor. It is cancerous. He had surgery, and they successfully removed about 80% of that, but that was all. But he's doing well, and they go home um, tomorrow, or, or, or Tuesday. I talked to Claudia last night. So he's doing well, and they'll be waiting for test results to decide what treatment would come next. And they appreciate everyone's prayers. Speaking of prayers, Jack Rhodes uh, had to be rushed to the hospital here at Waterman. And then airlifted down to Florida South because he had a serious hematoma on his spine and couldn't be treated here. Uh, they rushed him into surgery. They are able to, to clear that out and take care of things. But the, the doctor uh, initially said that he would be paralyzed from the waist down. That's not the case. The next day, he had movement in his feet and movement in his legs. And it looks like he will be relatively okay. And the doctor was amazed. So uh, I think we have a modern day uh, miracle before us. And they thank you all for, for your prayers. Thank you. Our, our call to worship the, this morning is this. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. Those who hunger for hope, those whose souls are parched. The Lord leads the fountains of grace. Let us who hunger and thirst come. Let us come and worship with gratitude and with praise the Lord our God. Our opening hymn is Come, now fount of every blessing. <laughs>
Let's pray together. Well, Lord our God, truly you are the fount of every blessing. Truly you are the wellspring of life and light and love. And so we do come together now to, to praise you, to praise your holy name, to offer our deepest gratitude. We come recognizing the constancy of your love. And the amazing goodness of your grace. We come seeking your presence, your spirit, your word, your encouragement, your correction, and, and your help. We come seeking your forgiveness. And offering ourselves and our gifts to you. And we come praying. Praying even as Jesus taught us, his disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
me thank you and Tom for the privilege of inviting me back. Always enjoy worshiping with you. We have several good friends in this congregation and always good to come and visit with, with all of you. Please join me in prayer. Our loving Heavenly Father, we come boldly before you in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. We come as sinners seeking forgiveness through your grace and love. We come as needy children needing the awareness of your presence, needing the assurance of your power in our lives, and needing a strong living faith. We stand in awe of your wondrous works in this world. We wonder at your gracious love and giving nature. We, out of our blessings, look to you with grateful hearts. But, O oh God, Jehovah, we live in a broken world. We've forgotten who we are as your redeemed people, and we've forgotten who you are as our rock salvation. Remind us we are the sheep of your own flock. Awaken us with reminders that we are your children, your forever family. Shake us awake to the truth that, that we are part of your eternal kingdom. And O oh Lord, we seek your spirit moving through this needy world. We stand divided, blaming each other, not knowing how to seek peace. We stand in the plague of this pandemic, wringing our hands hopelessly. We stand fearful of what tomorrow's may bring. We run to you, crying for your help, for your healing, for your hope. We pray for those that are seeking answers, those dealing with the virus, as well as those grieving over the loss of loved ones. We seek your wisdom and your guidance, your interference in our suffering. Our world, O oh Lord, needs an overwhelming bath of your heart-changing love. The love that sent Jesus, the only love that can bring peace and make siblings of us all. We're perplexed with sufferings of physical globe where we live. We're aching over the depth of division where politics of our nation have led us. And we're fearful of the many threats to our way of life, to our families, to our future. We're empty. We need your spirit at work in our lives, in our suffering world. We earnestly pray, come, Lord Jesus. No, Lord, we offer ourselves to you. Empower us as healers of the broken, as bridge builders, as lovers sharing your love. We pray now that you will hear the individual prayers of our own hearts. Our Father, as we remember those in our lives who need healing, who need comfort and bereavement, who need reconciliation in broken relationships. And we pray for ourselves. Speak to us words we need to hear. We offer these prayers in the renewing spirit in the name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen. <laughs>
2 Corinthians, Paul's second letter to the Corinthians, chapter 9, verses 6 through 15. The apostle had been talking about a collection to help others. And he says this, the point in this, the one who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And the one who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each of you must give as you have made up your mind, not reluctantly, not under compulsion. For God loves a cheerful giver. God is able to provide you with every blessing in abundance so that by always having enough of everything, you may share abundantly in every good work. As it is written, he who scatters abroad gives to the poor. His righteousness endures forever. He who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way for your great generosity, which will produce thanksgiving to God through us for the rendering of this ministry and not only supplies the needs of the saints, but also overflows with many thanksgiving to God. Through the testing of this ministry, you glorify God by your obedience to the confession the gospel of Christ by the generosity of your sharing with them and with all others while they long for you and pray for you because of the surpassing grace of God that he has given you. Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. Amen. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Speak, Lord, through your still small voice, that the ears of our heart shall be open and receptive to you. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Through our scripture, we see obviously that this is the stewardship season, and we're focusing on that. And some pastors I know don't like to preach on stewardship. And so it is a challenge for all of us. Someone said that the, the most sensitive nerve in the human anatomy is that nerve which goes to the pocketbook. And I think perhaps it's true. I heard about one pastor that was church needed finances. So and they kept having a hard time. So he had his friend, the electrician, come in and w wire the pews. <laughs> so that when he went to raise have money, the money raising Sunday, he said, I want every everybody who's willing to give ten thousand dollars this year to stand up. <laughs> and he punched the button and about four pounds stood up. He said, who's willing to get 12,000 this year to stand up? He pushed another button and four or five others stood up. Well, it went fine. He had reached their goal. And as he was leaving, he looked, came down through the church and realized there was his friend, the Scottish Presbyterian, Angus McDougall, still sitting there, <laughs> electrocuted. <laughs> Stewardship is a sensitive thing, but I remember when I was a young pastor, an older minister said to me, I don't mind reminding the church their need to give, because when I feel like I've gotten someone to give to God, I've done something for their soul. And so we focus on that, and we hear about, we hear about tithing, how important it is to tithing, especially from the Old Testament. And we talk about tithing, but I want to approach it a little differently and say, let me give you five reasons not to tithe. Five reasons not to tithe. 
First reason is don't tithe to support the church. Now I know the building and grounds committee is going to be pulling their hair out. But what I'm saying is that giving to God is so much bigger than giving, just giving to keep the church up. Giving to God is a holy act. And we're sharing with God and with others what he's done in our lives. And we give back to God. It is a holy time where we give. God is much bigger and giving to God is much bigger than light bulbs and air conditioning units. It is the time we share with God. <coughs> don't give just be, to support the church. And don't give, second reason, to just to get a payback. We hear a lot now about the prosperity gospel. And some uh, television preachers go on and say, if you give so much, your, your income will be doubled next year. And a lot of people pour money in, they think that's the, the way to do it. But it's not true. You and I know people that are very good Christians who struggle financially. And we've looked at some deeper Christians through uh, other suffering countries where Christians are very devout, but they still struggle with finances. We don't give just to get a payback. A cute story is told of a family that uh, years ago, they would come to the general market once a month, general store, and get all their supplies for the month. This family came and they had a little daughter and they had her with them while they were shopping. So after they paid up, they said, we're going to put what we bought in the truck if you'll stay in here and we'll come back and get you. Well, they loaded the truck up, went back, and she was in there staring at a, a jar of candy. And uh, the storekeeper said, you've been a look, good little girl while your parents were gone. Reach your hand in there and get a free handful of candy. And she smiled and looked at it, but she didn't move. And he said, go ahead, reach your hand in. Well, she didn't do it. And he said, well, here, I'll do it for you. So he reached in, got a handful of candy and gave it to them. And they left. And the parents said, why didn't you reach in? We know you're not bashful. Why didn't you reach in? She said, his hands are bigger than mine. <laughs> I tell you, God has bigger hands than we do. And when we experience the blessings that God gives us, we're overwhelmed with gratitude. When we stop and see what God has done, God, it's more, we are, we don't, maybe don't get the return like we would hope. But we're blessed in so many different ways. As the Apostle Paul said to the church in Corinth, if you give sparingly, you reap sparingly. If you give bountifully, you reap bountifully. And we, we reap the blessings of God in His grace and His love and His faith that we can grow and understand what God is doing. And He blesses us with so much more, so much more than just money. Several the ministers heard people from third world countries that come to the United States and visit. And I've heard many say, I know how hard it is for you to be a Christian here. I'll pray for you. And one said, I want to get back as soon as I can to my own country because here we lose faith because everything is provided for us. We don't have to depend on God. And so they recognize the need and the value of depending upon God for what they get. And we have so much, we don't have that need to lean on God. Third reason I don't pledge is to feel good about it. Some people say, give until it hurts. Others say, no, give until it feels good. Well, the Apostle Paul kind of lines it out and he says, be a cheerful giver. Don't hold back, but be a cheerful giver. If you've gone to some places, some other nations where there's not much 
they have very little to share. But when offering statement, they dance down the aisle. And they dance and they celebrate with laughing because giving is cheerful. And when we give, it makes us cheerful. And we understand what God is doing and we are grateful to be a part of what God is doing. We give and we're cheerful because God provides for us and we respond in gratitude. We don't give because God needs it. God owns the cattle on a thousand hills. He can raise up stones to speak. God owns everything. But the point is, is that when we share through the church, we're participating with God in what he's doing in the world. He gives us that privilege to share with others and to give and to meet the needs of others because that's what he's doing in the world. And we share with him what we're doing and how we grow in that. We give because of God's gracious love to us. But we don't give to buy God's love. John 3.16 reminds us, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son for you and for me. We don't buy God's love. God loves us. William Sloan Coffin talked about going to a, a friend's funeral. And he said, the preacher got up and said, the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. And he said, I began thinking about that statement. And he said, I, it suddenly hit me in the face. And I got kind of angry because I realized that God does give. God is a giving God. And he said, it, it kind of throws all human pride has to be hurled against the reality that God gives. And we're never more like God than when we're giving to someone else and caring about others. Well, that's five reasons not to pledge. But I have five reasons we should pledge. Five reasons that I tithe. The first reason is because God asks. In the third chapter of Micah, the question is raised. God says, how, you're robbing me. And we, we ask, how are we robbing you? He said, you have not taken your tithes to the storehouse. Our commitment to giving is important to God. Jesus told about 38 parables, and at least 16 of them are parables that talk about money and values of life and what how we should share. You remember the parable of the foolish farmer who all he talked about was himself. I will tear down my barns and build bigger barns and I will say to myself how good you are. And God said you fool. Tonight your soul is required. The foolishness of not thinking about others we know people that are like him that walk around holding hands with themselves because of the fact of the value they feel of what they have. But God calls us to look at what he does for us. The New Testament understanding is that we sacrifice, not just a tenth, but we sacrifice to God. And the value of, that God sees with that, we read from the book of Acts, from Ananias and Sapphira, where they sold property and came to the church and said, we're going to give all the proceeds, and, but they only gave half, and they lied to the church. And they fell down dead. God is important. God, God's value of money is important as he shared with us. So the first reason I tithe is because God has. The second is, it's who I am. I want to be known as someone who does give. It's a cockeyed world we live in. You heard about a farmer maybe that was going to market in his wagon and he was taking a, a pig 
his cell. And he had a wreck. A truck came around the corner, hit the truck, and everything was all messed up. Well, he had to sue the insurance company to get compensated for what he lost. And he got up and the lawyer put him on the stand and the lawyer said to the farmer, didn't you tell the policeman that you never felt better in your life after the accident? He said, yeah, I did, but you got to put it in proper perspective. He said, well, how is that? What do you mean? He said, well, when the truck hit up my wagon, he said, it knocked the horse over and broke his leg. He said, so when the policeman got there, here's a horse flying in, and, and he knew we'd never walk again, so he pulled out his pistol and shot him. And the pig was running around, bloody, screaming, and annoying everybody, and knew that it was no good, so he shot the pig. He said, he looked at me and he said, how do you feel? <laughs> <laughs> we need to put, keep things in proper perspective and know how God calls us to share. A third reason to give is because it's part of worship. You remember the ten lepers that were healed and one came back and we realized the ninth the nine were healed, but the one who came back and thanked Jesus and worshiped was made whole. He, uh, it was a more complete healing and fullness. That's what we do in worship. We come to thank God for his blessings and are grateful for his blessings to us. I'll share a personal story, if I may. I was in one church that we had a, uh, the treasurer was an accountant, which is not always wise. <laughs> but he came to me and he said, Mike, I know, I know what you're pledging to the church. He said, I'll offer you this opportunity. We'll withhold that from your salary and you won't have to pay tax on it. He said, well, you'll withhold it, and then you'll be given to the church. Church gets a benefit. You get a benefit. And I said, well, let me think about it. And I thought, no, I really don't want to do that because an act of worship is giving to God and taking from what you have to give to God. And I think that's important. And that's another reason. Another is my need to give. We say there are givers in the world and there are takers. And I want to be one who is giving. One who my children know, even though they're grown, and my grandchildren, that there are things that I value in life that I show through my giving and through my commitment. It's important that we do that that we keep the faith alive that is there and the challenge to honor what God has done. Paul wrote to the Corinthians and he reminded them again, God loves a cheerful giver, to give bountifully, but he said, you will be enriched in every way for your great generosity. And you see, we put things in proper perspective we come to know the importance and the value of sacrificing for God. Pope Pius IV, speaking about John Calvin, he said, the power of that infidel is the fact, is the fact that money doesn't matter to him. That John Calvin was successful and powerful because he didn't let money have its value before him. So there are those four reasons. And finally, the fifth reason I have is because I must respond to God's love. John 3, 16 again. For God so loved you and me, the homeless that we passed this morning coming to church, those that 
we see having children labor camps. God loves those. Those who are suffering around the world with so little, dying of hunger, God loves those. God so loved that he gave his son. We must respond to that great love. There's a scene in the rock opera, Jesus Christ Superstar, after the Palm Sunday parade. The people are standing around when Jesus comes. And one says, Jesus, you know that I love you. Didn't you see me wave? If we're going to respond to God's love, we've got to do more than just wave. Amen. Thank you. 